The devastation of recent natural disasters such as hurricanes Katrina and Rita awakens in California the reality of the next big earthquake. Are you prepared? Are our school prepared? Stay with us to find out. In January, it's so nice. Hi, I'm Bruce Grantham, and welcome to Our Children, Our Future, a program about education in the South San Francisco Unified School District. We live in an uncertain and sometimes unsafe world. Natural disasters seem to be occurring with more and more frequency, and there is the relatively new threat of an unexpected terrorist attack. All too often, schools have rev relatively uh, become the stage for intruding gunmen and destructive and psychopathic students. In this day and age, schools have to be prepared to deal with every variety of emergency. The quarterly fire drill or earthquake drill is just not enough. With me to talk about emergency preparedness in our schools are Pat Lodges, Supervisor of Attendance and Welfare with the South San Francisco Unified School District, uh, Matt Lucet with the San Mateo County Sheriff's Department Emergency uh, Office, and Battalion Chief Dave Quasney of South San Francisco Fire Department. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you. Matt, why is it important for all of the San Mateo County schools to be prepared in the case of a, of a disaster or crisis? Well, I think it's important because we don't know uh, when the next disaster will occur. There's a lot of disasters that occur not only uh, in the Bay Area but in the state of California, uh, whether it be man-made or natural. And uh, we need to be prepared. Uh, citizens need to prepare, particularly the schools need to be prepared. Uh, the schools obviously have a challenge uh, because there are so many people on the large campus whether it be their staff or their employees and schools need to be sure that they have the plans in place and equipment and supplies to assist following a disaster and as I said it could be man-made it could be natural and it really could be anything I mean uh, March of this year we had a tornado that touched down in South San Francisco right. so it's really as I said uh, right. and any type of uh, a disaster uh, and then lastly you know, the reality is, is, depending on the scope of the disaster, uh, first responders may not be available to rapidly respond. So it's incumbent upon the schools to make sure that they have plans in place, supplies and equipment to tend to those people on the campus. And South San Francisco was very fortunate to have you on their planning committee when they were putting together their plans, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in yeah. a few minutes. Dave, in South San Francisco, uh, in the event of a local emergency, what role would South City Schools have to play? The schools need to be self-sufficient. There's five fire companies in the city and there's many more schools than that and so we can't respond to each school immediately and so they'll have to be standalone for a while and part of that is that all teachers and staff need to know that under California Government Code 3100 they're emergency service workers and they'll have to stay on site until they're relieved and which may be a long time and assisting the students because not the fire department and the police department might not be able to respond immediately. And believe me, that's uh, come to uh, quite a surprise to some uh, local school uh, uh, employees uh, because in a disaster, one of the first things that you think about, in addition to your children in your classrooms and in the school, is your own family exactly. and, and loved ones. But they won't be able to respond home immediately if the district doesn't re uh, release, release them. them. Yeah. Uh, and you were sharing with me earlier what happened in New Orleans? Well, several, uh, as you probably heard, several police officers left their post and they were fired due to that. And the same could occur to teachers if they left their post. They need Close to, to 500, I think it yes. was, a large number. Uh, uh, Pat, how has the concept of, of school safety changed or become more comprehensive in the last 15 years? Originally, we would respond in terms of safety plans by having responses and drills for all your basic emergencies. Then in the early 1990s, the state of California required that school districts prepared comprehensive school emergency plans, which are plans that not only address emergency response, but plans that help to ensure that schools are a safe and comfortable place for children to be. This would be student activities, athletics, student government field trips, um, counseling and support services, all of those kinds of things that help 
make children want to go to school and then feel good about being there. But in the aftermath of the Oakland fires, this all changed. That's correct. And so in the early 90s, the aftermath of the Oakland fires, um, another expectation was placed upon all government agencies. In order to qualify for any kind of reimbursement from the state after an emergency, each government agency needs to be able to communicate with another government agency. Uh, this communication system is called Standard Emergency Management uh, System, and it came about because Senator Nick Petras, a California state senator at the time, had his home burnt in the Oakland fires, and he realized that had there been a better communication system among all the different emergency responders, his home most likely would have been saved. So he is the one that initiated the law, and as a result, we do need to have a basic communication system. System. And as a result of all that, in order to put all of this into place, uh, the South City Schools, in order to get some finances, some money to, to, to do all this, applied for a grant, uh, the Emergency Response and Crisis Management Grant. And uh, we received that grant in 2004 to the tune of about $127,000. Uh, and I just want to point out that it uh, was one of 56 that were granted nationwide, which was pretty impressive, granted by the federal government. Uh, and who were, the, who were the partners that uh, were on that committee to help put that uh, plan together? Well, initially, the uh, uh, planning started with our head of technology, Gary Meisner, contacting the superintendent and uh, getting us in touch with Kathleen Schuler, who's been an outstanding grant writer. One of the requirements was that in order to apply for the grant, we needed to have partners with our local responders. South San Francisco Unified School District includes um, children that live not only in South San Francisco, but in San Bruno and Daly City as well. So with the aid of our initial committee, Kathleen Gary, our superintendent, we contacted San Bruno Fire and Police Department, Fire and Police Department in South San Francisco and in Daly City. We were incredibly fortunate because they all agreed to help us out. And then in addition, we needed another agency, a counseling agency, and Pyramid Alternatives in Pacifica agreed to work with us. Pat, what are the, what are the key components of the, the emergency plan? Well, we were in a situation where our last plan had been developed in 1992 and we needed to revise it, and uh, we realized that we needed the assistance, hence going for the grant. The requirements are that the sites get their plans up to date, that the district uh, has its plan up to date, and then in addition that training be provided for staff and students so that we are all better prepared to respond to whatever emergency may come. Matt, Dave, why is, uh, is it important to have uh, the county and, and uh, local agencies such as yours involved in this type of a plan? I, I think uh, it's important because what we saw was when we got together and, 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 and South San Francisco was formulating this, this plan, it really allowed us to partake and clearly um, kind of educate insofar as the role of the school, the city, and the county. Um, and I think, you know, I personally learned a lot with regards to what type of resources the school may have or may not have. So I think it was a real good learning process for everybody. Um, and I think that's what's really important in having the local and the county involved with the school. And we're very fortunate because it's an excellent plan and we'll find out more about that. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to talk to two school administrators uh, who were responsible for developing their school site plans. It wasn't as easy as it sounds. Stay with us. Prudential California Realty is pleased to support the South San Francisco Unified School District. With several offices located throughout the South Bay, we help home buyers realize their dreams of ownership and sellers maximize their home investment. Prudential California Realty is a longtime partner with education, having created the Education Foundation in 1992, which provides grants to teachers throughout Northern California. Prudential California Realty, your partner in real estate. You've always been like a son to me, Mikey. And that's why I find it unfortunate that we're in this little situation here. No. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're going to pay for this. 
Peninsula TV, how will it affect you? My grandma used to say that an ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. At the time, I didn't know what that meant, but I think both these principles probably do. The South San Francisco schools were faced with the daunting task of developing emergency response and crisis management plans to be prepared for a laundry list of emergencies, from fire and earthquake and terrorists attacks to intruders and, and violent students on campus. With me to share their experience and develop these plans are Alicia Cummings, the assistant principal of Westboro Middle School, and John Thompson, principal of Sunshine Gardens Elementary School. Welcome. Thank you for coming on. Thanks. Thank you. In the beginning, what challenge did the two of you face in developing your, your, school, your school safety plans? John, you want to kick it off? Sure. Well, this plan, the template that we're using to develop this plan is quite a bit different than the traditional plan that we had, which was uh, not nearly as comprehensive. So just this plan forced us to rethink how we look at emergencies and the different types of emergencies uh, that are out there and to look at not only what's happening at the time, but beyond that as well. I don't know. I think for me it was finding the time to go through it and you know with all the other things that we're doing and, and do the, look at the details, look at the surveys, what training does, do, the te do the teachers have, you know special needs students, updating everything each year, meeting with the site council. I found that a challenge um, and sometimes just finding funds for the supplies that we need to have on campus for the things that the teachers have in their classrooms. I actually brought a couple of samples up here. I don't know if you want me to show them now. We'll take a look at those in a minute. Okay. But it's, there was a lot of detail in this in this yeah. sort of plan, and and a lot of people I think were had to be involved in order for you to come to come up with this. And as everybody can see, it's it's an extensive <laughs> it's an extensive big, document big that both of you have. Uh, there's always been fire and earthquake drills. We've always lived with those, and everybody who's watching this has always participated in them. But what's different about the school safety plan from the from the d typical drill that you've been running? I would say, in looking at the way we've done the plan on the new template, it covers the, f the four themes basically for any emergency. How are you? preventing it in the first place. What's your safe school plan? Pat Law just mentioned that earlier. How are the kids being connected to school so they're not feeling disaffected and want to take a gun and come on campus and hurt someone? Uh, then how are you prepared? How do you respond? And how do you recover it? Now, Alicia, I know your school, uh, for a variety of reasons last year, had to evacuate on several occasions, and on in some occasions had to be had to stay evacuated for an extended period of time, which is a lot longer than the, uh, the duck and cover drill that we're seeing now, uh, uh, that our viewers are looking at now, which is your typical drill. Uh, was that helpful in in you looking at? Hey, you know, there's a lot of things that we don't know what to do when we're out I, there I, for two hours. I, I think it made people realize, okay, now that we're out of the building, when you're with the kids for two hours, what do you do? Some teachers brought a deck of cards. They talked, you know, while they were having to wait, while the administrators were telling them, okay, it's clear, it's not clear, the police were coming, or whatever that is. They're waiting for instructions. And I think, though, the practice of doing that was actually beneficial because it did bring to light, you know, areas where we needed to work. Communication was one key thing because everybody's wanting to know what's happening, what's happening. Especially parents. Yes. Especially yes. parents. Uh, John, what's what's uh, what's in your plan? What's the, the plan composed of? Well, the plan is, like I said, very comprehensive. It has everything from the school maps, which you would expect, all the way down to lists of students with special needs, uh, roles, specific roles that each employee will undertake during an emergency. Give us an example of a, a fairly esoteric role that's not your typical fire drill role. Well, you have your emergency response team, and you have members on that team that are supposed to go out and look around and try and find, well, they have a very defined set of responsibilities that they have to go through. Um, there is the finance part of it. Someone's supposed to be keeping track of any kind of financial costs. Obviously, that would come into play on a more of a prolonged type of emergency, but mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, like I said, there are quite a few roles in here that, uh, well, 
it, just looking at the, whole, the plan as a whole, from the roles to the the list of students to the where the gas valves are, everything's in mm -hmm. here along those lines. Uh, let's say you you have to evacuate for 24 hours or longer. Major disaster, major problem. What's what's the, the biggest concern there? The biggest concern there is obviously sheltering in place providing food for your children, communicating with parents. Mm -hmm. um, so communication and supplies. I mean, how do you supply, uh, have enough food and water and supplies for uh, a student body of how many at your elementary school? We have a little over 400 students. We have middle, about 700. Uh, one of the high schools. High schools average between 13 and 1,500. Mm -hmm. Daunting. Yeah. You know, where do you get the supplies? Where do you get the money for the supplies? Where do you store yes. the supplies? What kind of supplies do you even provide? Yes. You know, some big questions, some big questions. Yeah. And not easy answers either. Uh, we've talked about the high school. Now, John, you were an assistant principal at El Camino High School prior to becoming a uh, principal of the elementary school. What particular challenge, what's the difference uh, that they might have at the high school from the elementary school? Well, although we use the same template to develop our plans, I think the biggest difference would be the logistical issues that high schools face. We, we mentioned that high schools have between 13 and 1,500 students. Well, managing a coordinated response with that many students mm -hmm. and, the, and the staff members that go along with it is complex at best. And even with a well-trained staff and a well-trained student body, in a situation where there's a lot of chaos and confusion, particularly at the high school level where a lot of your students have, act, they can leave, they have cars, they, they might not, they might be more inclined to find out what's happening with their families and not follow along with the program. That, that's, those are all issues that the high schools have to deal with. And at the elementary school, we don't have to deal with, it's, it's much easier to control your student body. You have fewer students, fewer faculty members. So that's the mm -hmm. biggest difference. And again, you mentioned supplies. Just finding enough food, water, shelter for 1,500 students is a, like you said, a daunting task. Do you feel prepared? I feel that we're being prepared as a continuing process. I mean, if there's a large disaster, you know, when the Red Cross struggles to deal with Katrina and all that, you know, what's the school going to be able to do? You do the best you can with what you have. And I do feel that we are prepared and we're continuing to work on that each year. And especially with this new template that we have, I feel so much more comfortable with it. It's much more manageable. The way it's divided, I think it's easy to understand with training as we train our staff. And that understanding and that training and that practice is going to make people uh, when they have to deal with a crisis situation, I think respond um, as best they can without as much stress and anxiety as it would otherwise. John, what would help you to be more prepared? <clears throat> time and money. Uh, yeah. the, the, the time <laughs> degree, needed to yes. train the staff effectively is a considerable amount of time, and it's not something can ha that can happen once in isolation. Yes. Coming up with enough money and materials and resource, well, money to pay to buy resources supplies, uh, and supplies. Yeah is not, in these times in particular, is not an easy But it would be fair to say that you're more prepared now because it, if nothing else, this is all raising more questions yes. than maybe answers, but from questions come some really solid yes. answers. Absolutely. And, yes. and John, you mentioned something, and we're going to move into it on this next segment, and that is uh, uh, training. Uh, emergency preparedness sounds great in theory, but what about the training? When we come back, we're going to look at a training session at Altaloma Middle School. Don't go away. If you live on the peninsula, there's only one place to get the latest news on business, sports, politics, education, and your community. Peninsula TV, Channel 26, the Peninsula and South Bay's Emmy Award winning programming resource. For more information or for a programming schedule, go to pentv.tv or call us at 650-637-1936. Peninsula TV, your community programming channel. Real Estate with Bobby Decker is for anyone who owns a home or aspires to do so. Everything that is important to or an interesting facet of home ownership will be covered by our program. Please join us. You won't want to miss Real Estate with me, your host, Bobby Decker.
Emmy Award-winning Peninsula TV provides a large multifunctional TV studio and video production facility, state-of-the-art equipment, and affordable prices. Let our professional staff and crew produce your company or organization's next video, or create your own TV series and air it on one of the Bay Area's largest community cable channels. Contact Peninsula TV at pentv.tv or call 650-637-1936. Welcome back. A few weeks ago, the staffs of Westboro and Altaloma Middle Schools met at the Altaloma campus to go through the first school district orientation and training on the new emergency response and crisis management plan. With me to review the training that day are Alicia Cummings, who's staying with us for this segment, assistant principal at Westboro Middle School, and Kathleen Schuler, the school district consultant who authored the grant and conducted the training at Altaloma. Kathleen, welcome. Uh, Kathleen, before you uh, get to the training at, at Altaloma, as grant writer on this project, what was your biggest challenge in, in writing the actual grant? Mm. It was really an issue of priorities, time, and expertise. <coughs> to develop a, uh, a grant such as this, it really but forces the schools to focus on some areas that are, they don't do every day. They're not emergency planners, not in the business of emergency preparedness. So one, making it a priority when you have all the other issues. All the other this, priorities. All the other issues. Yeah. Getting time with staff. And the third part was the expertise. Unfortunately, we had our partners come in and provide the level of expertise that we as a school district didn't have. Uh, as far as the training day at Altaloma, uh, you had about 70 people 70 there. 70 people, yeah. That day. Yeah. Uh, could you very quickly outline uh, the, the, the training day, what it looked like, and what you wanted to accomplish? OK. We developed really three modules. The first module was to familiarize everybody with the plan and more particularly with their roles and responsibilities. Then we um, participated in a desktop exercise. And in that, you're actually presented with a scenario. And then t school teams can talk with one another mm -hmm. in terms of how they would respond. And ranging from what do you do when the earthquake first hits to you've suddenly discovered it is a major earthquake and parents are going to be home for six hours. They had to then start planning how they would uh, respond. Mm -hmm. The third module was an actual simulation where they would return to their rooms, they were given some um, scenarios, the alarm rang, and they were on their own. Before we get to that, we have a video, a little bit okay, of video yeah. of that simulation. Before we get to it, Alicia, what, when the, when the uh, staffs were sitting at the table doing the tabletop exercises, some more theory, <clears throat> if you will, what was their reaction to that? I think, I, I think it felt like a lot of information to digest all at once. Even though they had been you know, given the packets with their differing roles, it, it's just a, a massive amount of information. What I do think they appreciated was that it focused your thinking on, OK, the earthquake hit, then what do we do? And as, as Kathleen was saying, oh, the parents aren't coming for six hours, then what do we do? And it really made you focus on, OK, what's the next step? What's the next step? And I felt, I felt that was very helpful, and so did the staff. Good. Uh, before we go any further, I really want to make sure that we see the video that we have. Uh, so let's take a look at, at some of the video from the simulated uh, emergency and the implementation of the emergency response plan on that day at Altaloma. If you could roll that. The custodian is showing the uh, uh, one of the crews how to turn off the gas. <coughs> and also the water, it looks like. Okay. 
wines. Okay. And it okay. winds all the way down, screws. Okay, and so it will you take, just keep turning until it stops. We've got the minor injuries here at the first aid station. There's an unconscious student up in room three that we left due to neck injury with one of the work rescue workers until it gets medical attention by a doctor. Is it in commander? We have a search and rescue back, Sean. Okay, and where are they at? They're over meeting with first aid. Sean, so they're bringing students over there? We can go and assess the situation. We don't know. Okay, please assess the situation. Come back to me and know how things went. Yeah, the gas is shut down. It's shut down. Okay, we got to call We got a down power line. Down power line. Okay. So you just pull it. Okay. Then you take. Do the pose. Okay. Now you stand up. Get a little bit closer. Okay. Then aim at the bottom. And then you squeeze and sweep. A lot of, it seems like a lot of the students would have been left without supervision, possibly. Um, I know there were some people that weren't on teams, but it seemed like there would have been lack of supervision for the students if everyone on the team for doing their assignment. In bad shape, there was uh, much ceiling down, doors jarred, windows broken, lots of debris in the hallways. There were, the, our main problem was that we could not get into the classrooms, and so we do need as the campus is being secured, gates locked, whatever, signs should be posted to direct the parents where to go. And that would be to the parent liaison. Sorry we cut off the last, last part of that, that, that speaker, but you get the idea of what the simulation was like that day. Uh, Kathleen, how important is the simulation, do you think, to the whole concept of the plan? I think it's the only step we can take that, that gets the plan out of the book and getting people to start to own the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We're asking people in the case of emergency to do things that they never do on a day-to-day -day basis. A teacher may know how to help a kid learn to read, but they may, don't necessarily know how to uh, lead a search and rescue team or how to turn off the, the, the gas valve. And they brought up some great, uh, great points. Uh, the first thing a teacher does when they leave the classroom in evacuation is lock the door. Yes. And one of the things they discovered is the rescue team doesn't have keys to get they, into the room. They, they couldn't find but keys. Very valuable. Very quickly, Alicia, how prepared is Westboro Middle School for a major disaster, do you think? I feel that we are prepared. However, I do believe that we need practice, practice, practice. And this simulation was so valuable because it brought up a lot of discussion mm -hmm. over what could we do better, what else do we need, the keys were an issue, more communication, more people with radios. Those are the kinds of things we need to address. Well, thank you very much. I know we're not totally prepared, but we're better prepared yes. than, we, than we were in the past. Yes. A very timely topic. I want to thank my guests for sharing their views tonight. Uh, Pat Lodges, Matt Lucet, Dave Kwasney, uh, John Thompson, of course, Alicia, and Kathleen Schuler. I'm Bruce Grantham for Our Children, Our Future. See you next time.